Hey, um, so I'm going to be talking about VL2, um, a scalable and flexible data center network. And the reason I chose to give this talk is it's actually very closely related with the FBS paper that Alex is going to talk about later on. And in fact, there's a small reference to the uh, FBS paper inside of the VL2 paper. Um, but before that, a little bit about me. Um, Sorry, and Dylan, if you want to get in touch with me after this talk, here's my contact information. Um, so I'm going to cover VL2 in a couple different ways. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with the design goals and really what the folks at Microsoft are trying to achieve uh, with VL2. And then I'm going to shed a little bit of light on the history and context of where we came from and what networks used to look like before VL2 existed and, and kind of the effects that VL2 has had. And then go on into the actual implementation of the, the network that uh, VL2 is using and then a bit of a discussion of how that network enables future applications and data centers. So the design goals of VL2 are pretty straightforward in the sense that they wanted a scalable network that's going to be reliable and still have layer 2 semantics. So what do they mean by uh, a scalable network? They mean a network with high capacity. They wanted a network where the servers were not bound by the fabric, but yet they were bounded only by the ability for the systems to produce traffic. Um, and they wanted full bisection bandwidth. And full bisection bandwidth effectively means that at any point of the network, if you cut it, or in the worst point of the network, if you cut it, there's an equal amount of bandwidth on both sides. And in reliability, they were aiming for performance isolation. One of the things that the uh, authors of the paper pointed out is that as cloud computing is becoming more and more ubiquitous, there are heterogeneous applications that are running on these fabrics that don't necessarily get along super well. So how do we make those agree? And lastly, they wanted layer two semantics. And what they mean by, by layer two semantics is the ability for servers to move throughout the network. And additionally, they wanted individual servers to contact one another without having to go through any kind of uh, proxy layer or anything like that. So a little bit of context of where we came from. So layer two networking used to be ubiquitous inside of data centers. And layer two networking is you know, what most of us call ethernet. In ethernet, we all use MAC addresses. Uh, which were assigned to physical devices. They were actually burned into your NIC. And uh, as of recently, when we transitioned to one gigabit networking, we've left behind hubs and CSMA, CD, and we've all moved into switched networks. And it, it requires a minimum spanning tree in order to work, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But there's three semantics for the kinds of traffic you have in layer two networks. You have unicast traffic, broadcast traffic, and multicast traffic. So that's pretty straightforward. So, talking a bit about how to, uh, layer two networks work and look, they actually look like fat trees. And fat trees are a specific implementation of the clos topology that requires that every layer above the lower layer is the sum of the capacity at that lower layer. Um, that means that you have to scale up your switches as you go up in the infrastructure, and that becomes very expensive very, very quickly. So a little bit about the learning aspect of how the actual switching happens and, and why that's a problem. So in learning in a layer two network, the servers aren't necessarily announcing where they are. Learning is a passive operation. So if server A wants to send a packet to server B in this network, none of the switches know where to send that traffic. So that's handled in a unique, scenario, in a unique case called unknown unicast, where the traffic is actually handled as broadcast traffic. So what occurs is that that switch will flood every port on the network, except the port that that traffic came from. And in doing that, the MAC address table is populated on all of the servers around, all the switches around the switch that that traffic originated from until the traffic has spread out throughout the entire network and everyone knows where that server that originated the traffic from exists. This can be problematic in several senses um, in the sense that it'll continue to loop if we're in a graph. So how do we deal with that? We use spanning tree. Um, a spanning tree protocol was invented by Radio Perlman uh, way back in the day, and it's really the protocol that's made the modern internet work. And what that means is that we have to reduce the network down to a minimum spanning tree. So we have to block all links in the graph that allow loops and turn it into a tree to prevent the loop scenario in your traffic from constantly flowing throughout the network and causing a storm. So layer three is what rides on top of layer two. It's the next layer in the OSI model. And it's a little bit different in the sense that uh, it uses IP addresses to, to locate things, and these are uh, ephemeral. They can move around the network. Um, and additionally, they, they don't use a switched network. They use a router network in the sense that uh, devices are only making local decisions, and they don't have to be aware of the entire topology in order to make these decisions. 
And there's a couple of different ways to do this. Um, the paper talks about OSPF, which is a link state protocol, and it's a dynamic protocol. But you can also do this statically, where you pre-program all the uh, devices in the network. So switches only need to know about the next top, and these can be hierarchical entries, as opposed to having to have a full entry of all of the 48-bit addresses in the network. And the way that you tie layer two and layer three together is using a protocol called ARP, which uses the broadcast semantics of layer two networks in order to determine the IP address to uh, MAC address relationship. And this can either be gratuitous or non-gratuitous in the sense that if a new device comes on the network, it can actually announce its location. So what's wrong with these traditional designs? Um, these traditional designs had limited server to server capacity. As I mentioned before, the fat tree networks, as you get higher and higher in layers, those devices have to get larger and larger. And that can become very, very expensive very quickly. And in that sense, there was often segregation of these layer two networks. In um, a ACMQ article by uh, Bayless and Kingsbury, they actually referenced a lot of the issues related to layer two networks um, and how those were considered to be failure domains. And by sharding those domains, they were able to make the network significantly more reliable. And in that same sense, because we have to reduce the network down to a minimum spanning tree, reliability and utilization is a major pain. If you have N plus one redundancy, you're never actually gonna be able to use that entire capacity that you've purchased. You're realistically only gonna be able to use 50% of the capacity or less in a production network. So what do we wanna build for? We wanna build for a data center network. We wanna build for unpredictable traffic patterns with heterogeneous applications. And those heterogeneous applications produce two kinds of flows primarily. Elephant, which are large flows, and mice, which are things like RPCs. And additionally, we want fault tolerance. So if an individual device dies in the network, it's not gonna cause an interruption of the flows in the network. So with that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the VL2 topology and the actual implementation that they used. So the topology itself is a scale out topology as opposed to a scale up topology. In the sense that they're adding devices horizontally as opposed to buying very large devices. Um, and then they use OSPF for reconvergence and for routing the layer three addresses in the network. And their network also supports encapsulation, which allows them to do clever things around flow steering and traffic steering. So, I talked a little about how layer three networking works traditionally and layer two networking works traditionally in the sense that it has one canonical address for the device. But instead of that, they actually added two addresses. The first address, which is the uh, LA, is designated to a physical device. So an individual switch could have an LA, a server that's outside of VL2 could have an LA. Servers and devices within VL2 would have application addresses, AAs, and this allows us to do clever things around building virtualized networks on top of those physical networks. Another novel insight that the uh, topology has is that they, they added an interesting mechanism for load balancing. So they're using two mechanisms, actually. Uh, the first mechanism that they went with was uh, valiant load balancing, which for this is effectively randomized load balancing. And one of the nice things that was pointed out in the valiant load balancing paper is that it can handle arbitrary traffic matrices in a non-blocking manner. Um, addition to that, they use ECMP. And ECMP basically takes a hash of the five tuple of the packet in order to determine the next hop for that packet. And the reason why it does this is that uh, you get flow-based load balancing. And the reason why you want flow-based load balancing is that the TCP transmission model expects a roughly ordered layer to ride on top of. Otherwise, the congestion control algorithm shrinks the congestion window uh, to basically make the protocol unusable. Um, and also, they had an AnyCast enable network. And AnyCast is basically where multiple devices will announce the same LA in order to handle failover and ECMP-based traffic sharding. The last component that they added in the topology was the directory server. And the directory server is a uh, device which maps the LAs to the AAs. And they did a couple of clever things here. The first thing that they did is for uh, making changes to that. Uh, they had a Paxos state machine that they went through, but all of the actual queries weren't done against these uh, state machines. They were actually done to replicated caching instances, and they also had active cache invalidation to enable changing LA to AA mappings very quickly. Additionally, layer two access controls rode on top of the directory server, so if a server was asking for a route to a specific host, the directory server could actually enforce security semantics based on you know, knowledge about the network. So what does a topology actually look like? Uh, it's a class topology with a larger spine and full bisection, and has uh, ECMP to load balance between sets of spines. 
So in this network, there's a four wide spine, but that four wide spine is actually split into two sections. Um, and the reason why that's split into two sections is because ECMP and commodity networking hardware typically has a width that it's bound by. In the paper, they point out that most commodity networking gear has a four-way uh, width for ECMP, and although there's vendors that talk about 256-way width, this severely limits the size of the TCAM and the number of entries that you can have in there. Um, and then the actual AAs are assigned addressing space in different addressing space from the LAs. So what does an actual host communicating need to do? When an actual host tries to communicate, it contacts the directory server and it asks, where, how do I get to this AA? And there's an agent running on the server itself that intercepts ARP requests and that intercepts packets in order to uh, trigger these directory lookups. And the directory server gives it one of the AnyCast addresses that's assigned to a pool of spines. And in doing that, it's able to assign labels on top of those spines in order to drive that traffic. So the first label that's put on top of it is the penultimate hop, and then the top label is the spine hop. And in doing this, as it traverses the network, that packet is de-encapsulated until it gets to the uh, penultimate hop. In that case, it's the actual packet itself. So you're probably curious as to how this is handled in failure, and that's where ECMP and AnyCast come in. Because those pods of spines have any cast addresses, in failure, OSPF reconvergence kicks in, and it results in that traffic being redirected the other or to the other spine in that pod. So a bit of a summary. Um, VL2 shifts the intelligence and routing decisions of the network from the network itself into the hosts. And it's relatively simple in the sense that it doesn't have a centralized controller like so many SDN implementations that have been proposed do. And the data plane itself is just doing very, very simple routing operations as opposed to trying to do complex encapsulation and de-encapsulation. Um, and those encapsulation, de-encapsulation uh, operations it's performing are, are hard programmed into the network. So a little bit of discussion of, of why they made these decisions. Um, so one of the big things that they talk about in the paper is the volatility of traffic patterns inside of the network. So given that you can have elephants that collide with mice, how do we deal with that? The way that they talk about it in the paper is that even though these rarely occur, they need to be able to rehash these flows in order to prevent them from colliding. In addition to that, they use the TCP congestion control to have a non-interfering network. So, I mean, that's ideal to have a non-interfering network. Worst case scenario, they move the traffic around. Additionally, because they're using such simple chips, they're able to use commodity hardware. And that means that they're using fixed 1RU switches. These devices are actually some of the most reliable devices in networks today. They have like a 0.1% failure rate. <coughs> and lastly, the network is built on top of proven technology. So it's using technology that the internet has actually used for decades and decades before it. And then the replicated state machines are using a Google or a Microsoft implementation that allows them to very easily do this. It was already built in DAP. Uh, work that they had done previous to this. So some other benefits that you get from this by separating out the AAs and the LAs is you get host high availability, meaning that hosts can move throughout the network very, very quickly. You enable end host to, to control the data plane without having to necessarily work with the data plane. And when there's failures in the network, they typically affect less than 25% of the traffic in the network. So what is the actual effect of this? Today, in 2015, these networks are very, very common to have virtualized layer two networks on top of layer three fabrics. In fact, Amazon recently published a patent on using this very technology with MPLS as opposed to IPIP. And it showed me that you can build reliable, scalable networks with full bisection bandwidth out of commodity devices. And um, there's a handful of related material of pieces of work that have been published around this. Other than that, are there any questions? Sorry, I went fast. So in the paper, in section four, they, what? Oh, um, so the question was, in real life, do mice and elephant collisions not happen often? So in the paper, they talk about this in section 4.6. And um, what they did, so there's actually two parts of the paper. The, one part of the paper is the design. One part of the paper is an actual survey of traffic patterns inside of data center networks. 
So they actually took a data center fabric from Microsoft and looked at what was occurring, and they found that traffic patterns are basically random. The best fit traffic pattern they could come up with had a 60% best fit. So given that, the first problem was you can never predict it, so don't even try. The second part of that is in the actual server, they, they rarely saw these collisions happen in real life where there was actual interference. Um, it was something like less than 1% of overall traffic. Uh, 